Just like in part 1, I'll talk about a few random murders from the 1920s, some famous, some virtually forgotten. So without further ado, let's get into it. Nathan Leopold Jr. and Richard Loeb were both raised in wealthy families and both could boast high IQs. They befriended each other as college students at the University of Chicago, and grew closer after finding out that they were both interested in crime. It was all a pretty normal beginning, but it would quickly take an unexpected turn. Leopold was the more academic of the two, and devoured intelligent books. He took up an interest in the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, and developed the idea that he, as well as Loeb, being highly intelligent, did not have to abide by the rules of society. He brought Loeb into these beliefs, and, with their mutual interest in crime, they set about committing some themselves. They started with petty crimes, namely theft, which developed into arson, and nobody suspected them of anything. This arrogance, further built up with philosophical justification and the success of avoiding suspicion, eventually led to something far more sinister. In a scheme that could easily have been taken from a Pulp Fiction story, the two planned on committing the perfect murder. First, they would have to carefully choose their victim. The poor soul they eventually chose was 14-year-old Bobby Franks, the son of a wealthy watch manufacturer. They made careful preparations and took every precaution, using a stolen typewriter to write the ransom note and rented a car. It was all completely premeditated. They put their plan into action on May 21st, 1924. They went to Bobby Franks' school and offered him a ride, and they were eventually able to coax him inside. Loeb moved to the back seat on the passenger side, while Franks took the passenger seat at the front. After a moment, Loeb struck Bobby in the back of the head multiple times with a chisel, then quickly shoved the dying boy to the floor to hide him. They drove across state borders to Indiana about 18 miles away. Then they poured acid all over the body and hid it in a pipe near some railroad tracks. But the boy's disappearance was noticed earlier than they had anticipated. They returned to their student lives. Loeb was quiet, but Leopold spoke freely about the missing boy and the crime, passing it off as just a morbid interest. Of course, he didn't implicate himself or Loeb, but the arrogance of it was foretelling. They had sent a ransom note to the family, but before the family responded, the police had already found the body. And what was more, they found a pair of glasses at the scene, and they hadn't belonged to Bobby. It didn't take police long to trace them to Leopold, who smoothly made up an alibi. He and Loeb were further questioned and Leopold said they had taken his car that night with some female acquaintances. But his family's wealth betrayed him. The family chauffeur confidently stated that the car had not been driven that night, and soon enough, Loeb confessed and implicated Leopold in the murder. And their motive? Just for the thrill of it. This disturbingly empty motivation to brutally murder a child made the Leopold and Loeb trial into a media frenzy, and was one of the trials commonly referred to as the trial of the century. The public wondered how two young, good-looking, wealthy college boys, who had everything going for them, could resort to such barbaric actions for seemingly no reason. The wealthy families of the defendants made them able to secure the renowned Clarence Darrow as the defense lawyer. While their guilt was undeniable and their motive inexcusable, Darrow was able to get them out of execution. Instead, they were sentenced to life imprisonment plus 99 years. Loeb was later murdered in prison in 1936 after a dispute with a fellow inmate. Leopold, on the other hand, after 33 years of imprisonment and after countless unsuccessful attempts to get parole, he somehow managed to get released. How he managed to do it is difficult to comprehend. Perhaps it was because, in the accepted narrative, he had not actually committed the murder, though he had certainly helped plan it and carry it out willingly. But nonetheless, in March 1958, he was a free man and lived 13 more years until his death in 1971 in Puerto Rico. He never apologized for his part in the crime. Next is Andrew P. Kehoe. I think this is the third video I've mentioned him in, so if you've already seen the other times, you probably already know the story. But his crime was so cold-blooded and calculated that he absolutely belongs in this list. Andrew P. Kehoe was the treasurer of the Bath Consolidated School in Bath Township, Michigan, 
a small town that had a population less than a thousand in 1927. Kehoe lost the race for re-election as treasurer, and that was when he started planning something truly diabolical. It took months. As a volunteer handyman for the school as well, Kehoe secretly carried packages to the basement of the school in the north and the south wings. Then, sometime between May 16th and May 18th, Kehoe murdered his wife Nellie by striking her with a blunt object, and placed her body in a wheelbarrow. On May 18th, his farmhouse caught fire after he had set timed explosives. Probably as Kehoe was driving towards the bath school, it too blew up. The packages Kehoe had been carrying had consisted of dynamite and pyrotol, and he had set both sets of bombs to explode at roughly the same time. The school was in chaos. Children had been thrown violently into the air, some even being launched from the second-story windows. The northern wing of the school had completely collapsed, crushing those on the first floor. Then along came Andrew Kehoe in his truck, casually pulling up to the scene. The superintendent of the school had been busy in those chaotic first minutes heroically carrying children to safety. When Kehoe's car pulled up, he went over to him. But Kehoe had another evil surprise up his sleeve. He had laced his truck with more bombs, which he also detonated, this time with added metal farming equipment that acted as shrapnel, instantly killing two more innocent bystanders, including the superintendent, along with Kehoe himself. The bodies of the dead were laid out under white bedsheets on the scene, and the town hall was converted into a temporary morgue to house them all. And what's more was that, as police were carrying out recovery efforts, more unexploded bombs were discovered in the south wing. These were quickly and carefully diffused. If these extra explosives had detonated, the entire building probably would have collapsed, and would likely have killed almost everyone inside, including more than 230 children. The only consolation in this story is that that second set of bombs, for whatever reason, did not explode. In all, 45 people were killed, 37 of them children. It is sometimes called the Bath School Disaster, but this was no disaster. It was a massacre, meticulously planned and carried out by one evil man. And after all that had happened in the more than 90 years after this event, this remains the deadliest school massacre in American history. The next day, while the remains of Andrew Kehoe's house were being examined, the locals found Kehoe's chilling last message on a wooden sign attached to his fence. It read, Criminals are made, not born. But considering Kehoe's petty motivation for the massacre, it doesn't hold much merit in this case. It seems that Earl Nelson always had unusual habits, even from an early age. Reportedly, he was involved in an accident at the age of 10 and was thrown from his bike and suffered a head injury. After this incident, Nelson's behavior changed drastically and was described as being a deeply disturbed child. When he was 18, he received a two-year jail sentence for breaking into a cabin. He thought it was uninhabited, but this was nothing compared to what he would do later. In 1921, at the age of 24, he attempted to molest a 12-year-old girl while working as a plumber, a crime for which he was arrested again and sent to a mental hospital. He was released in 1925 after being a pesky patient, having tried to escape multiple times, and even succeeded a couple of times. Then he began his murdering spree. The year after his release, he strangled his middle-aged landlady in San Francisco, and then engaged in necrophilia. He then went south to Santa Barbara, where he strangled another middle-aged woman in a boarding house, then killed yet another middle-aged woman, another landlady, in Oakland. California police were not oblivious to the striking similarities of these three murders, and suspected them to be connected, though they weren't completely sure. Nelson probably realized this as he went back up north, this time to Oregon. In Portland, he raped and murdered another landlady, though this victim was younger than the previous ones, at 35 years old. He stuffed her body in a trunk filled with clothes. The next day, he murdered yet another middle-aged woman. Then, for the third day in a row, he murdered yet another landlady. Nelson, rather unwisely, went back to San Francisco only to murder another middle-aged woman. I think I'm beginning to sound like a broken record at this point. By this time, police were convinced that at least some of these murders were connected. Almost everything matched the M.O. of a single person. 
All of the women had been strangled, almost all had been sexually assaulted, whether before or after death, and most were either middle-aged or landladies. The elusive, bloodthirsty murderer was dubbed the Dark Strangler, and witness descriptions were beginning to match up, creating a profile for the killer. To avoid repetition, I'll just briefly summarize what happened next. In late 1926 and early 1927, Nelson was able to travel all the way across the country, claiming more victims along the way. One in Council Bluffs, Iowa, three in Kansas City, Missouri, which included an infant, one in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, one in Buffalo, New York, two in Detroit, Michigan, and one in Chicago. And that's still not the end. In June 1927, Nelson crossed over into Canada, where he murdered a 14-year-old girl in Winnipeg. Her body was found days later in Nelson's rented room, naked and mutilated. Nelson had slept at least one night with the body underneath. Another woman was killed within the same time frame in the same general area. By this time, many witnesses had identified a man with the same features as the Dark Strangler, including a few who gave him rides when he hitchhiked. The case was now highly publicized and well known throughout the US and Manitoba, Canada, where the most recent murders had occurred. Nelson was captured near the US-Canada border in Manitoba because he fit the description of the Dark Strangler. Police were unsure if it was the right person, but multiple witnesses positively identified Nelson in lineups. At first, Nelson, probably intoxicated with the publicity, admitted to at least some of the murders, but retracted his statements later and denied any involvement. His trial lasted only five days in early November 1927. He was promptly found guilty and sentenced to death and that sentence was carried out on January 13, 1928. He killed, at the very least, 22 people, all women except the infant boy, from California to New York to Canada. Aside from the bizarre psychology of a psychopathic serial killer, Nelson had no actual motive for his murders. So that's it for this video. It just goes to show that while the 1920s still has a good reputation as a fun, exciting time, there were still the bloodthirsty, psychopathic killers that every decade has. But if you want to learn more about the fun side of the 1920s, or maybe some more of the darker side, please consider subscribing to my channel. Well, that's all for now all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for part 3.